the Aston Martin DB11, a supercar, and one of the best looking Astons ever. But its aerodynamics are highly unusual for a supercar. To begin with, its drag coefficient is just a 0.3. That's well below the typical supercar, which hovers around 0.34. But there's more to it than just that. It also has some impressive aerodynamic features, like a front splitter that actually works, and something called an aero blade. In this video, we'll cover the DB11's aerodynamics and how all of these features work together. This is a simulation of it at 72 kph, or 20 meters per second. First, a plane cutting through the center line of the car. The color bar is in meters per second. The first thing that stands out to me is that it's green. But the second thing that stands out to me is just how streamlined it is. Looking over the entire car, the flow stays attached everywhere except at the rear of the car. That right there shows the difference between this supercar's aerodynamics and most other supercar's aerodynamics. When you hear that a car, or anything really, is aerodynamic, there are a number of things that could mean. It could mean that it uses the air to do something really well, or it could mean the exact opposite, where it lets the air flow by with almost no disturbances at all. Most supercars try to do the former, where they have wings, large splitters, huge diffusers with massive strakes, and so on and so on. All of these features are designed to use the air to do something, usually to produce downforce. In that way, many of these supercars are definitely aerodynamic, but the DB11 takes the opposite approach. It tries to slide through the air as seamlessly as possible. It might not seem like a big deal, but that difference greatly affects the car's performance. As mentioned earlier, the typical supercar hovers around 0.34 for its drag coefficient, with some of the more aggressive ones getting closer to 0.4. While that is definitely bad for top speed, it's a necessary price that needs to be paid to produce so much downforce. It's not that those cars want to have high drag coefficients, but rather they don't have a choice because downforce is more important to them. Here, Aston definitely did not prioritize downforce. In fact, if I were to guess, its looks were probably prioritized. Actually, I know a few people at Aston and Aston's sister company, Jaguar Land Rover, they usually actually prioritize a more holistic approach to car design, but because its looks were so heavily favored, that came with an inherent streamlinedness. Streamlining a car favors drag reduction. So the DB11's low drag coefficient wasn't just a function of the designers trying to lower it, but also because its looks favored low drag too. So the drag coefficient is partly a coincidence. But let's talk about its front splitter because I said that it actually was done very well, especially for a supercar. Supercars often feature aggressive splitters, but most fall into this category of being aggressive, but not aggressive enough. What I mean by that is, if you've seen some of our other videos, you'll know how I often talk about how so many splitter plates are too sharp and flat underneath. As a result, the air that flows over them separates and a wake is created. That comes with more drag. There are a few options to fix that. The first is not to have one at all. That's not very helpful. So the second one is to extend the splitter upstream more. What that does is cut into straighter flow. So the flow going underneath the splitter is at less of an angle to the splitter itself. The reason why shorter splitters get flow separation underneath is because the flow that goes around it is highly angled. In this video, for example, you can see just how vertical the flow is close to the surface of the car. That makes a lot of sense because there is a wall here, so the flow crashes into it and has to redirect. A little higher, the flow is less skewed because of some of the flow going into the grill, so not as much flow has to be redirected. There's kind of a buffer now, but lower down, we don't get that. Here we get vertical flow. If you have a short splitter, like we have here, the flow hitting it is vertical. It can't go around a sharp edge, stop, turn 90 degrees, and then flow underneath. Instead, it tries to flow around the sharp edge, can't, and then separates. So extending the splitter more forward, aligns the flow with the splitter more. The problem with a lot of supercars and hypercars is that they do extend the splitter forward, but not usually enough. Only extreme cars like this one extend them enough. You can see just how hard it would be to drive around in this car with a splitter this long. Even trying to run someone over would be difficult. Who's thin enough to fit under there? So most supercars have splitters that fall into no man's land. They still get good downforce, but they also have separated flow underneath and that increases the drag. That's the second way to fix splitters, extend them forward more. The third way to fix splitters is by simply rounding the underneath more. That's exactly what Aston did here. 
You can see how underneath, the splitter isn't flat, it's actually quite thick with an exaggerated knife edge shape. What happens is the flow comes along, goes underneath the splitter, and instead of having to turn 90 degrees and go underneath, it only has to turn maybe 45 degrees or so. That is far more manageable for the air, so we get attached flow over the splitter. Because of that, the drag from the splitter reduces. Now, 45 degrees is still a large angle for the flow to stay attached over, and if you're wondering how it can do that, we covered why in this video we did last week, along with a bunch of other intricate details. If you look closely under the splitter, the flow stays very fast. That's partly because of how effective the splitter is. What that means is that the rest of the underbody has more energy to work with. Anytime you can feed the underbody with higher energy flow, it's better, because you now have more to work with and produce more downforce. Actually, if we look at the pressure, we see just how efficient the splitter is. Look how underneath it, all we see is low pressure. That's pretty rare. It's rare because of the general nature of this region. What you're doing is cramming more flow underneath, and that naturally comes with the back pressure pushing back on the flow. We've seen it many times in our other car simulation videos. It's very common. Here though, we don't get that. That's great for downforce because now you don't have high pressure underneath the car, pushing the car upwards. But why don't we get a back pressure? If it's so common, why don't we get it here? Well, it comes back to just how efficient the splitter is. Even in last week's video where the front edge was pretty good, there was still quite a bit of slow moving flow near the surface. The slower the flow is, and the more room it occupies, the smaller the space is for the rest of the flow to go through. As such, you're trying to push more air through a smaller opening, and that is going to give you higher back pressure. Because the Aston splitter is so efficient, we get very little slow flow in this region. That means it has maximized the area available for the rest of the flow to go through. This car really shows why it's so important to make the splitter properly. If you don't and you get flow suppression underneath it, you obviously get a large wake and more drag, but that larger wake underneath also restricts how much flow can go through and increases the back pressure and reduces how much downforce you get. I'd say that this splitter might be the best we've ever shown on our channel. I'm not sure how much aerodynamics went into it and how much was styling, because it looks good too, and it's a lot more functional because of that little slope at the front makes it easier to go over speed bumps and out of driveways without scratching the front off. This splitter really is the tops. Just quickly, if you'd like us to simulate your very own car, let us know here. Let's look at the top of the DB11 now because this is a key reason why it is such low drag. The velocity plot shows how there's almost no bad region. The hood is fantastic. It's sloped down to meet the flow at its angle. That way, you're not trying to force the air to go over a sharp edge, unlike the M2. As a result, very little drag is produced here. Another key detail about this hood curving is that the curve is shared along the entire length of the hood. The hood isn't flat with just a highly curved front. The benefit of doing the Aston's way is that it reduces how much high pressure you get on the windshield. That's because the hood windshield junction is a little shallower. If the hood were flat, then that angle that they would meet at would be much sharper. The sharper the angle is, the more the flow is going to slam into the windshield and dump its kinetic energy into it. That's just drag. So by curving the hood, they reduced how much drag is produced by the windshield. The front of the roof isn't that great, it's pretty average. That's because there is a lot of flow acceleration over it and low pressure, so this region isn't something to write home about. But once we get past that point, the rest of the roof and the rear window are again fantastic. They're blended so well together that the flow almost doesn't notice that it's transitioning between the two. As such, the velocity stays pretty constant. There's a little deceleration, but it's pretty good. That comes with some low pressure, but the low pressure is quite consistent down the window. And because it's pretty consistent, there's no real back pressure, also known as an adverse pressure gradient. The result is a razor thin boundary layer. That's actually ironic because <laughs> Aston made a big deal about not using a rear spoiler or rear wing to produce downforce. It does have one, but it isn't always deployed. Instead, they made use of something called an aero blade, which we'll cover in a sec. But the reason why having this boundary layer so thin here is ironic is that this would be the perfect car to put one on. You can literally mount it very low and it still gets very fast flow. You can see here how just a few centimeters off the back, the flow is free stream. I don't think I've seen that before, at least not done this well. But it doesn't use a rear wing for much of its operation. So this incredible boundary layer, or lack of it, is kind of going to waste here. 
Other cars that could really use a thin boundary layer because they have a rear wing usually have thick boundary layers. Another major benefit of such a thin boundary layer is you now have a little bit more energy shooting into the wake. That makes the wake smaller and lower drag. So you can see how almost the entire top surface of the DB11 is not only sleek, but leads to lower drag downstream. Now, the downside of this general top design is that it produces widespread low pressure. That's obviously not good for downforce because the only way to make the overall car produce downforce now is to drop the pressure underneath the car to a lower value than on top. We don't really get that. We get some regions of low pressure, but other regions of higher pressure. That is the trade-off you get when you get low drag from this design. Let's now move to the Aeroblade because it is one of the major highlights of this car. First of all, what is it? Well, it's a little slot at the back of the car. Air from just in front of the seat pillars funnel through and shoot through this little slot. The idea is that it shoots the flow up and creates downforce in a very efficient way. And given that it's using flow from around the seat pillars, it's supposed to be more efficient. Honestly, I don't think it's any good. I think it's really just hype and I'll explain why. So first of all, in this plane, we get a great view of this region we're talking about. It's just this little white strip. Now, the exact way this works is obviously a secret of Aston Martin. So what we did was simulate five meters per second exiting it, which seems a reasonable value. But in addition to that, we also grabbed this video. It's actually a picture, but if you go to the website, you can see the entire video. It's of the actual car with the aeroblade being tested. Let's cover what is going on. So in the simulation, the flow exits, but flows down pretty quickly. The angle and the persistence of the flow to travel at that angle gives a good indication of how much downforce is being produced. For example, if you look at a diffuser, a good one kicks the flow up quite a bit, and even half a car length or more downstream, the flow still has a good upwards trend. For the aeroblade, there is almost no upwards trend, and anything there is dies out very soon afterwards. The same thing can be seen in the wind tunnel test. The flow exits, but flows down very quickly. That tells us that little downforce is being created by the aeroblade, and it's not that hard to see why. The aeroblade is a very thin slot. Not much air can go through it. So the mass flow rate is very low. As such, you're not going to be producing much downforce with it. The aeroblade's size is fairly limited. It could be wider, but it's kind of fixed. So the only other way to really produce good downforce from it is to jettison the air much faster. Because air from in front of the sea pillars are used, you only have the free stream flow to work with. So the airspeed is kind of limited. You could boost it through a contraction, but then there's only so much you can do before the back pressure is too much. And then the air that was entering in front of the sea pillar is going to be pushed out now. Another possible benefit of the aeroblade is that maybe you're tapping off bad flow from somewhere and just using it. So there isn't much of a loss. In fact, you're getting something, even if it's just a tiny amount of downforce for nothing. That would be good, except if we look at this plane, the flow entering upstream of the sea pillars is fast moving. In fact, because Aston did such a good job with the upper part of the car, there is no wake upstream. The flow is great. So I wouldn't be surprised if the aeroblade increases the drag coefficient because you're taking good flow, winding it through the car, manipulating it, and then throwing it out the back. There's going to be some loss there. After seeing the simulation and the test, I really think the Aeroblade is not much of a thing. The name sounds good, and the idea is good, but the reality of it is pretty negligible, and possibly bad overall. This simulation was done with OpenFoam. If you want to learn OpenFoam, check out our courses here. Let's now look at the diffuser. I quite like it. That might be surprising to hear because in this plane, the flow clearly separates over the last part of it. A large wake is formed, and more drag but I think that's because of the flow speed. And yeah, I think the edge here should be rounded, but it isn't. Rounding the edge would make the diffuser perform much better at lower speeds, but at higher speeds, I wouldn't be surprised if the flow stays attached over it. It might not, but there's a greater chance because the flow has more energy now to flow around the edge. Again, it would have been better just to round the edge to begin with, but maybe they kept it sharp for looks. If they did, then the aerodynamics pays a heavy price because the diffuser is a major part of the car that can dramatically improve its performance. Here, they're sacrificing a smaller wake, which means this little edge is dramatically increasing the drag coefficient, and because the flow separates at the end, the flow isn't kicked up as much, so downforce is lost. It's kind of ironic again because Aston put the aeroblade on so the DB11 would have some downforce at lower speeds, 
and then a rear spoiler wouldn't have to be deployed. But if they just rounded that edge, they could get way more from the diffuser with a lower drag coefficient too. So this car has a couple ironic things about it. Now let's move over at left half a meter. The Aston is very impressive here. The flow may be even more impressive than the center plane. There's literally only one problem area and that's behind the rear wheels. Actually, the diffuser isn't too much of a problem here compared to regular cars because regular cars often have the rear wheels wakes crashing into the diffuser and ruining its performance here anyway. But compared to supercars, the DB11 is lacking a little here. One way the rear wheel wakes are controlled here are by using strakes on the diffuser. They are effectively guide vanes that channel the flow and keep it from corrupting the other regions. Here, putting some on the inside of the rear wheels would help reduce how much the rear wheel wakes rush in. You can see here how this plane isn't actually slicing through the wheel, but we still get some wakes from it blowing out and into the diffuser. It's very natural for that to happen because the diffuser usually has some low pressure around it and air loves to rush into low pressure zones. So this is normal, but it doesn't mean it's good. Adding strakes like many supercars would isolate the rear wheel wakes and reduce how much of the diffuser is corrupted. That way, you can leave more of it to be corrupted by the edge. But I understand why Aston didn't put on strikes. Strikes are very angular and aggressive, which clashes with the DB11 style. That's why I said earlier that I'm almost certain that the looks here were the driving factor, well above aerodynamics. Now looking from on top, this plane is about half a meter off the ground. You can actually see in through the windows. I wonder if there are any people in there. From this view, I'd say that this is probably the worst plane of the entire car, where pretty much every other plane we show has pretty sleek and streamlined flow. Here, the wheels are messing it up. That's not surprising. Aston went very large with the wheels, again, for looks, but with that comes huge wakes and a lot of drag. Actually, the front wheels is the offender. The rear wheels are pretty good here. And coming back to the aero blade, if I wanted to tap off bad flow from somewhere, I'd probably get it from just in front of the rear wheels, put a contraction in and shoot it through the blade. That would reduce how much of the wake flows over the rear wheels. This car suffers from a common problem. The car's wake effectively starts at the rear wheel house. That's because the wake from the rear wheel is kickstarting the rear wake. The flow can't reattach over the rear edge, it just separates. That increases the drag a little, and one way of fixing that is through rear vents. That allows the rear wheel house air to escape back and ideally be guided over the rear part of the car. That helps reduce the wake size. But again, putting cuts and vents into the car starts to make it look more aggressive, which might have been why they didn't do it. Overall, this plane is probably about the worst, but still on par with most regular cars and supercars. Some supercars are better, like the Rimac Nevera, which we made a video about here, but some are about the same or worse, like the 911. In this plane, which is 80 centimeters off the ground, the wheels are still the biggest weight producers. And that makes sense because the drag orbit shows just how much drag is coming from them, especially the front wheels. And the same problem occurs past the rear wheels where the wakes from them just don't allow the flow to reattach and make the rear wake smaller. The same solution of having some vents to help get the flow inside the wheelhouse to the rear without flowing around the sides would probably help. So the Aston Martin achieves a very good drag coefficient of just 0 0.30, and there are a few key problem areas that if they fixed, would lower that even more. For example, the diffuser and even removing the aeroblade. Because there wasn't much of a focus on downforce production, it produced 16.2 kilos of lift, so about the size of a small sandwich. But that was done for styling and drag purposes. Considering that, the DB11 might be the most aerodynamic supercar going around. If you're staying on YouTube, YouTube thinks you'll like this video, so check it out. Thank you for watching. Peace out, amigos.